John chapter 17, let's begin in verse 6. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all are, and all are mine, are, all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for the sakes, for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Let's pray together. Father, we know this is a holy time when we, your family comes together, your sons and daughters, to worship you, to get poured into, to love one another. Lord, and we want to just be completely yielded to you and your Holy Spirit. We're not just interested in some religious exercise. We want you to engage you and you to engage us. We want to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We want to be fashioned and made more like Christ and conformed further into his image. So our hearts are yielded to you. Speak to us as you would want to speak to us, Lord. Help us to be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. We thank you that you tell us the truth. We thank you that you are the truth. And we commit it in Jesus' name to you. Amen. Please be seated. As we saw last week, this great high priestly prayer of the Lord Jesus is not really the Lord's prayer. I mean, what he prayed, our father earlier, is not really the Lord's prayer. This is really the Lord's prayer. Um, there's, he taught them to pray when they asked, teach us to pray. And he gave them that model in terms of an outline of what to pray. But now he's in this situation where he's, he's um, needing to help them understand certain things that they would best understand by hearing him say things to the Father and pray for them. And so he purposely prays out loud. And he gives us the reason uh, why in verse 13, what we saw, we've read it before, but it says, but now I come to you and these things I speak in the world, that's audible, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. So the reason why Jesus prays out loud is for the purpose of joy in us. And I love a God that would have a pri as a priority that we would have joy in ourselves because what God has done in us. Jesus knows disciples both then and now um, need to hear these amazing truths that he says to the Father to be able to maximize our joy. And it does. Um, to hear God the Son pray these 26 verses to God the Father brings us so much unspeakable joy because we're overhearing something that he shares from his heart to his father. And in the context of great need and great, great, you know, um, him facing so much about to get arrested, they're about to cross the Kidron Valley, go over to the Garden of Gethsemane, which was on the Mount of Olives and, and pour out his heart and, and, and say, if there's any other way, let this cup pass for me. And he sweat as it were great drops of blood and there was silence, and he accepted that. It's not my will, but your will be done. And then immediately after that, he was arrested, and then the whole chain of events started happening regarding ending, culminating in, in the cross and him dying for our sins. So that gives us great, great joy. 
And so this week, still, and we're still following the outline of the chapter, this, this week we're going to focus on the prayer to the disciples. Last week we saw verses 1 through 5, Jesus prays for himself. This week we'll look at verses 6 through 19, where he prays for the disciples. And the next week, Lord willing, we'll look at verses 20 through 26, where Jesus prays for future disciples, and what that includes us, which is great to, 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 to be able to read that and go through that and everything. So this title of my message is Jesus' Great High Priestly Prayer Part 2. And, and as we've seen, the context is that Jesus is finished with the upper room discourse, what's known as the upper room discourse, where he's communicating these things to his disciples, pouring into them everything that they need to be able to, to, to best prepare for what's coming, because it's a rest and the cross and everything. And he's trying to preemptively uh, work in them so that they'll think back on these things and it will help them in this time of confusion, of doubt, all these things that would no doubt likely be flow, overflowing their hearts and their minds and everything. And so he's building into them. We've seen it from chapters 13 all the way through chapter, the end of chapter 16, these things that he's saying to them. He promised the Holy Spirit. He said, I won't leave you as orphans. I will send another of the same kind helper or one that comes alongside to help and he will teach you all things he'll bring back to your remembrance all things that i've said to you and and he, he shared all these such deep things you know, i'm coming back for you if i go away i'll receive you myself to where i am you'll be there also he, he there's so many incredible things that he said to them that they needed to hear it probably only covered probably took 45 minutes to cover all that in terms of him just speaking it we don't know but, the, but he was very deliberate in what he said to them because he wants to prepare them. He wanted them to be fortified against the attacks of the enemy, of course, their own doubts, all these things. Uh, and, and so we've been seeing that. And so now he's turned his face to the Father. He's turned his focus to the Father, praying to the Father, but purposely doing it audibly so that they could hear, knowing that he would lead the Apostle John someday, 35, 40 years later, or more, to write these things down for future disciples to be able to receive joy as well. Now, verse 6, he starts, he says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. So he says, I have manifested your name. Again, we went over this before, but we just have to remind ourselves over and over again. When it says your name, he's not talking about his name like a, a name like we would have a name. He's talking about your character, his character, his his essence, his nature, his ways, something commensurate with his word, all those things. He goes, I have manifested that character. I have manifested that nature, all of those things. Jesus told, already has told Philip, we saw it, he who has seen me has seen the Father. How, why could he say that? Or how could he say that? Because that's exactly what he says here. I've manifested your character, your, who you are, to you. So we know the Father because we've seen what the Son has done. Everything Jesus did, he manifested the Father's character, the Father's name. So we don't, we don't, need, we don't need to see the Father to know the Father. We, we just have to know the Son. And if we know the Son, we will know his character, his nature, because those two things aren't mutually exclusive. Jesus' character and his, his ways and his name and his essence, all of that is commensurate with the Father's, but he's, but he's demonstrated that by living it out through the Lord Jesus. Then he said, they were yours, talking about the disciples, they were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. They were the Father's to give to the Son. And, and I'm sure that elated them just to hear him say that he was, they were given to Jesus. He ordained them to be apostles. So he, I'm sure it blessed them so much to hear that, that Jesus considered them a gift that was given by the Father to them. And for them to hear Jesus say that to the Father about them probably brought an unspeakable joy. And, and what a blessing that, that is to think about it even for us as well. And he says, they have kept your word. The word kept there is an interesting word. Jesus is going to use a word that's kind of different later concerning um, him keeping the disciples. But he says he, that, you know, that they have kept your word. And it really means to guard or watch over. Like the military would talk about if someone guarded a post, he would say they kept watch. 
they would guard. They would keep the they would keep the the oversight of something. They would they would they would basically steward or manage a, a certain position or outpost, and it was their responsibility to do it, and they would do it. So this reveals the disciples valued and guarded in their own hearts the Father's word. They recognized that what Jesus said came from the Father. And they reverenced that. They reverenced those words and valued and trusted those words. They recognized those words for what they were. Verse 7. Now they have known, now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. And we need to know that it says, they have known. Now they have known all that all things. And that word known is the word gnosko. It means knowledge by experience. It's not talking merely something that's intuitive that they know or something that they've learned just from theory or mentally or cognitively. It's about you've experienced something. And, and when we know something, when, we, when Jesus said, if you'll know the truth, know by experience. That's our word gnosko. And the truth shall set you free. We can't just know it in our heads. It's not just head knowledge. It's actually experiencing. You learn things by going through things. Especially the Hebrew mind has always been, you know something by experiencing it. It was the Greeks that had this philosophical, mental, they valued that way more than other cultures did. And they, so these Greek philosophers were, were kind of came on the scene and, and people, you know, valued that and everything. And I'm not saying it doesn't have value, but the, the, the Hebrew mind was trained to, you experience something and that's how you know it. So the disciples, they have known by experience that the things the father has given Jesus are from him. So they know all things Jesus received was from him. And Jesus made sure of that by revealing that this was of the father. He ta- talked about that regularly. He talked about that the, the things that he said was from the Father. The things that he did was from the Father. He said, I always do those things which please the Father. Something that we are working towards getting better at and growing in all the time. We want to be able to say that. We always do those things which please the Father. But Jesus could say it, and he did say it. And he did say that these things uh, were from the Father. James, the half-brother of Jesus, would write that every good and perfect gift is from above. He said every good and perfect gift. And I think that's good for us to recognize that everything that's good, everything that's, that's a blessing is from above. And he wants us to recognize that. It, what it does is it produces thankfulness in us. And we can actually receive good things and recognize the true giver of those things. Wouldn't it be horrible if you, even as a kid, it you know, definitely would be easier as a kid, but it wouldn't be, still would be difficult if on Christmas Day, when you're opening up all your presents, you have no idea who all those presents are from. You don't, they're not your, from your parents. They're not from, you don't know. They're just gifts that show up. Now, being as how I was as a kid, it would bother me for about three minutes, probably. And then I'm like, just, just unwrap them. Who cares? Let's just enjoy them and, you know, just get into it. You know, my, um, Evil Knievel, little motorcycle that you rev up, you know, um, dating myself a little bit. Um, but I had the sit and spin. I love the sit and spin. I would just go around and around and around until I would basically throw up. So I needed like a little barf bag with me. It's like, what makes children so masochistic when it comes to doing stuff like that? Just, you know, I had the slinkies, you know, and then Stretch Armstrong. That was a big mistake to give me, Stretch Armstrong. His arms could stretch and they said I couldn't break it. Please, I can break Stretch Armstrong. You just tie his arm around a doorknob and grab the other arm and start walking. And you just keep going inch by inch and eventually something's going to snap. Now, I had to do it in my room where no one could supervise that and stop that in the middle. But trust me, he has limits. Uh, So it's like, but what if all those things just showed up and you're like, I don't know who this is from. It would, it would not be the blessing that it could be. And that's what it is. We, all these things that God has blessed us with, part of maturing as a believer is being able to look at things and recognize that this is from God and he's blessing me with these things and to be able to thank him for those things. It's, I feel so, in, a, in one sense, I feel really bad for people that don't acknowledge God and to all the blessings that they have. And they really have a hard time on Thanksgiving uh, because in terms of people that don't believe God exists and all of that, 
because you can't enjoy that this is actually from him to bless you and to bless your life and to be able to be, be thankful. It's just really difficult for, for, for people that won't acknowledge him. So I just, I just love that. I love the fact that he, he comes in and says, every good and perfect gift is from above. Now notice in, uh, in verse 8, Jesus references their receiving and believing. Look with me there in verse 8. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them. That's a key word there. And have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. So Jesus relayed the words from the Father directly to them. And what was key for them is that they received and they believed that Jesus was the Messiah, was sent from God. He says, they have received them and they believe that you sent me. And it's incumbent upon us to focus how well we receive the words of Jesus. You know, it's easy to just pick and choose what you want out of Scripture. Just like, oh, I'm, you know... I, I get to decide what's true and what's not true, and I'm, I can receive them or not receive them. And it's up to me. The thing is, we're not judging the Bible. The Bible's judging us. The Bible's searching us way more than we ever search the Bible. And we have to believe all of it. And sometimes it's really hard to receive something, just like faithful are the wounds of a friend. You know, the, the, it's hard for us to receive difficult things sometimes, but God calls us to be humble and to be able to receive from anyone at any time, and he wants us to, but we have to have a teachable heart. And Jesus says to the Father, and they heard him say this, that they have received these words. They have received and have known surely that I came forth from you. It wasn't by, well, he might be from you. No, he, he emphasized to the Father that they have believed that you sent me. Now, there's a whole parable that Jesus talked about related to how well we receive the Word of God. It was the parable of the soils. And, and I love how honest the disciples are because they're like coming to him like, we don't understand. We don't understand this. We don't get it. Um, we're not even going to play around. Maybe they tried to hide that at first when they realized that he knows their thoughts and stuff. It's like, why are we even trying to fake him out? Like, we just have to be honest. And we don't understand this. And Jesus said, this is important. If you don't understand this parable, you can't understand any of the parables because it's foundational related to how the word of God is, works in our hearts and what it, how it produces what it produces in our hearts. And it was, it's important for us to have the right kind of soil in terms of the right kind of heart to be able to receive. And he talks about different conditions of the heart that gets in the way of us fully receiving the seed or the word of God because Jesus plainly tells the disciples the seed is the word of God. He tells them. And the one that has the, when you marry the right heart with the seed of God's word, then you get that massive crop, that exponential crop. And God's looking for fruit. He wants a return on his investment. He wants fruit from our lives. He doesn't just want us to have this blessed life where we're never affecting any other, anyone else's life for good. We looked about that, looked at that last week that he saved us for good works in Christ Jesus for good works that he's prepared in advance that we should walk in them. So he hasn't just saved us to give us this blessed life where we're just keep to ourselves. We have, we have all these goodies and all these blessings and we never make a difference. We never have him work through our lives. That's not why he saved us. He saved us unto, not by good works, but unto good works. And so he, he recognizes that the key to, under, to bearing fruit is my capacity as a disciple to receive God's word. And receiving God's word is believing God's word and acting upon God's word. That is the way that we demonstrate to ourselves and to God, to everybody, that we actually believe God's word is if we act on it. Faith without works is dead. James wrote, you know, you say, you know, he says, I'll show you my faith by my works. We're not saved by works, but we're saved unto good works. But not everyone can receive God's word. Not everyone is humble enough to be able to receive God's word. And if they can't, it says more about them than it does anything about God or God or his word. So they believed what he said about himself, and they believe that he is the Messiah and that he came from God. And they get to hear Jesus say that to the father. What a blessing. What a blessing. And we get to see Jesus say that about us because we're disciples. 
we're, we're not apostles, but we're disciples. And, and he, he, we believe that Jesus was sent by God. We believe Jesus' words. And that blesses Jesus. And it blesses him so much that we believe that. Now, he starts to pray for them more specifically in verse 9. We're told, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Again, stressing that they were a gift from the Father to the Lord Jesus. What a blessing for the apostles to hear that, that they were a, a, a blessing to him and they were a gift. You know, and we have been given to Jesus by the Father in the same way because it touches on election, predestination, all that, which is a whole other study in and of itself. But they, they heard this and it blessed them so much, I'm sure, and, and just to be able to hear that, that that was the case. Then he says in verse 10, And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. So he's saying, we both, they belong to both of us. They belong to both of us. And that was a blessing for them to hear him say to the Father, that we belong to Jesus, we belong to the Father, we belong to both because everything that the Son owns are the Father's and everything the Father owns is the Son's. But notice he says, he adds, and I am glorified in them. Whoa, to hear that. I am glorified in them. Remember who these guys are apart from the Lord? Just a, a, probably an hour or so earlier, they were arguing about who's the greatest. And Peter talked about, you know, though they all stumble, I will never be stumbled. And all this self-confidence, I mean, all this self, you know, righteousness or whatever, and pride and everything. And, and, and so he, I'm glorified in them, in that I will work in them. I am working in them, and I will continue to work in them. And because of that, I will be glorified. That should be all of our prayers. Pray to the Father that he'd be glorified in us, that he would be, be praised and he would be um, uh, esteemed highly because of our lives. And that's what God gets to do as we yield to him, as we yield to the Holy Spirit, as we yield and submit our lives to him, he gets to change our lives and work through our lives in a way that brings glory to the Father and, and to Jesus because he's glorified in us. Because there's no explanation <laughs> I say this all the time. I joke about it because it's funny to me. But, you know, I, I, I'm nobody. I'm, I'm a former break dancer. I barely graduated high school. I took three years of freshman English. How many of you have taken three years of freshman English? Oh, there's no hands? Okay. That's what I thought. I, I am the foolishness of this world. I, I, apart from the Lord, I have no wisdom. You know, it's, it's, and I think everyone is, should be you know, able to admit that. And, and when, when someone is highly esteemed in this world... God has to do so much more pruning and breaking to get them to be usable. So the fact that we are who we, we are is, should be an encouragement to us because there's, there's less things he has to do in us to get us to be usable. And it's beautiful, but he wants to be glorified in us as we yield. It's all about faith and it's all about yielding. Those two things, just focus on trusting him no matter what and focus on yielding your life day by day, moment by moment, hour by hour, something we're all, including myself, growing in to be yielded to him. Because if we're, yield, if we're yielding, then he can direct us. We can hear his Holy Spirit say, go talk to that person. Go give this person some help financially. Or go encourage, go pray for somebody. See that person over there? Go, they're lonely. Go, go be a friend to them. Just to get outside of ourselves. Again, we get so wrapped up on our schedules. We're busy. We're doing, we're doing thing, good things. I know that. But we have to be interruptible by the Lord. He has to have the freedom to say, I want you to be salt and light. I want you to help this person. I want you to get outside of yourself and, and be available for people. Because Jesus always was. He was always available for people. He was never inconvenient. You never saw him get impatient. He, he was always patient and gracious. But what did that require? He, he spent so much time with the Father. He got that, that spiritual fortitude, that strength as a human, the human part of him, from the Father every single day. So I love that. It's so encouraging that, that he wants to be glorified in us. Verse 11. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name 
those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. First of all, he says, Holy Father. It doesn't appear anywhere else in Scripture. And, and he's, he's recognizing that God is distinct, of course, and he's set apart. He's going to talk about that. But he says, keep those through your name. Again, his character, his nature. Um, keep through your name, through your character, who you are. Not who we think you are. Who you are, whom you have given me. And he says the reason there, that they may be one as we are. Now, he's, this is just the very beginning. We're going to get into this next week a lot. You know, talk about unity a lot next week when he's praying for us as future believers. But he's going to just start talking about this, this, this beautiful thing that the Holy Spirit wants to do in each part of the body of Christ of produce unity. Unity is different than conformity. The cults do conformity. They force similar behavior but that's not the Holy Spirit working. That's man forcing their will upon people. But God promotes unity in the sense that the Holy Spirit's working. The unity of the Spirit, Paul wrote to the Ephesians in chapter 4. The unity of the Spirit. To keep, we're told to keep the unity of the Spirit. He's always trying to push us together like, you know, like fusion of an atom. You know, the, and the enemy is always trying to divide called fission, dividing an atom. And when you divide an atom, bad things happen. Division, the enemy's math is division. He loves division, but God's always trying to bring us together, but he doesn't force us to be together. He's compelling and working through his word to bring us together. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing. That's how the, I mean, what if your body was divided? What if all of a sudden your hand just started doing its own thing? you know, and just like punch it in the side or something or doing it, even a good thing. Maybe it's always wanted to scoop ice cream all the time, you know, something that you would like, you know, a lot like ice cream, but you couldn't stop it. And it was just always doing its own thing. It wouldn't, you wouldn't, you can't get much done to say nothing of being distracted, but you couldn't actually get much done. He wants the church to work together to, to, to reach this lost world and to be salt and light. And we can't be unified if we're going a million different directions, doing our own thing. So that's, that's, a beautiful thing that he, he, he lays out. Now he gets to verse 12 and says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept and none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now the word kept there is a different word. When he said earlier that they have kept your word, that's a different word. That again, that means to guard everything. This has more of an idea of protect and to watch over. And that's comforting to me to think about that God keeps me and guards me and, and, and he's not wanting me to, to, to guard or protect or, or watch over uh, him. <laughs> Obviously, he doesn't need anything like that. But, but he says, I kept them in your name, in your character. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. So he says it twice. And none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. He's talking about Judas. He says, verse 13, but now I come to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. This is the verse that we read earlier. He's saying, this is why I'm speaking these things out loud. I'm speaking them in the world. That means audibly. So that they may have, they, that my joy, not their joy, my joy that's from me is fulfilled in themselves. He, he says that, just so we know that. And then he says, but I'm coming, now I come to you. And it's a present tense, it's saying, but now I am in the process of coming to you. That's the, the verb there. And, and, and I'm sure, I just can't imagine how much he longed to be with the Father again. We just saw him talk about the glory that I have with you before the world began. Just thinking about that. We know nothing of that because we don't know anything about how great that was. And just the level of condescension that had to happen for him to come to this earth and just to be a human, period. To say nothing of how he was born, where he was born, poor family, all of those things that we talked about, but just to be able to come to this earth at all, just to be in the middle of time and space, just to be inside this, this way that he has set everything up had to be so humbling for him. So he can't wait to get back to the Father. He says, I am coming, but now I'm coming to you. Verse 14, I have given them your word 
And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So this is really the only time in this this upper room discourse, this is really the only time that we hear him talk about or him say that the world hates the disciples. He says, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. But this he's saying right now, the world has hated them. And it's only because they were connected with him. And that's what we have to remember when we get hated on. You know, haters going to hate. You know, when they're hating on us, we need to recognize they only hate us because we're connected with someone that they hate and we're connected. And, you know, that, that's an honor. That should be an honor for us. You know, Jesus talked about when you're persecuted, rejoice because, because the Holy Spirit rests upon you when you're being persecuted. We think that's the worst thing in the world that could ever happen. God doesn't see it that way. He's not trying to protect us from, I mean, unnecessarily like self-caused persecution. Yeah, he doesn't want us to be engaged in that. But in terms of persecution for standing up for him, for preaching the gospel, for loving people, for standing up for truth, he does not mind us being persecuted. Um, And and he says that that they're not of this world. And we're not of this world. You know, um, there's so many different things that we can focus on in his word that's supposed to encourage us. But one of the things that, that I think he really intends for us to, to really grab onto and to help us and comfort us is that this is not our home. This is not our final place. But yet we can be so invested in this place. We, we can be so, and I don't, I'm not talking about this necessarily financially. I'm talking about just emotionally, mentally, and, and we can be so... Um, like the spirit of the world could just take such a hold on us where we're so impressed with this world. We're so invested in this world. There's no eternal perspective. God's always working to get us to have more of an eternal perspective because we don't have eternal perspective. We can't be interested in eternal souls that are going to be eternally separated from an eternal God. And he wants us to have that. He wants us to have that passion for lost souls to obey the great commission he wants us to make disciples and, and to expand the kingdom of God. So he says there um, that they are not, we are not of this world. The disciples weren't, we're not. And he says, I, I, I do not pray, verse 15, that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. He can't take, take them out of the world because it was going to be through them that they were going to spread the gospel. It was going to start and spread all over the world and it's still spreading to this day. So you, you know that they would have loved to be taken out of this world and gone to heaven too, just to stay with him. But that wasn't part of the, his plan. He's not going to take them out of the world, but keep them, that he should keep them from the evil one. And that's important. Keep them from the evil one. Jesus told us to pray, deliver us from the evil one. Peter wrote in his first epistle, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So it requires us to be sober in every way. We need to be sober. To be vigilant, meaning that we're supposed to be um, consistent and, and, and persevere. And, and to, to be careful to maintain good works, we're told in Scripture, to be faithful to Him. A servant of the Lord must be found faithful. He wants all those things in our lives. And He's warning in this, Peter is, that there's this big danger there with this, this enemy that's coming and, and he, he can devour like a lion and you shouldn't take him for granted or, or underestimate him. But at the same time, we can't give him too much credit. So many believers that give the enemy way too much credit. You know, Satan is, is not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere at once. So he decides where he should be, and I'm sure it has a lot to do with the biggest threat to his kingdom. So yes, there's lots of demons he dispatches and everything, but um, he doesn't want us to be um, completely like enamored with the possibility that we're under attack. Yes, we get under attack. But most of what we say is the enemy is our own flesh, and we need to recognize that. And so we need to submit ourselves to God, and that's what he says right before this verse that I just read, and humble ourselves before him and resist the devil. We're never told to rebuke Satan. We're never even told to talk to Satan, but we're called to resist the devil, and he will flee from us. 
So he says again in verse 16 that they are not of this world just as I am not of the world. And again, it's the second time he said that. The Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be, it's talking about the rapture, um, uh, that it, and also after that, that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So our citizenship is in heaven. And that, that's, that's where we belong. We're just, we're just passing through. And it, it sh- we shouldn't we always have to be focused on God's kingdom and, and, and heaven and all those things and be in his word and focus on that because you know that's, what, that's how we'll be the most useful for him. And he wants us to be useful for him, obviously. Then in verse 17, it's a big verse. Uh, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is true. That can go on and on and on. This could be a whole multi-Sunday sermon series. I'm not going to do that, obviously, but it's, there's so much to that. And he says, sanctify them. Sanctify means to be set apart. It's something that you have special use for. You know, you know, my grandmother had, I think my grandmother had a really nice set of china. I didn't really focus on it as a young boy, but I think it was a really nice set. I don't know. I don't know china really well, but those, that was special, special dishes for special occasions. And, and that's the kind of the idea. Set apart is special use. All, everything, we're going through Leviticus right now in, in, on Thursday nights, and we're going through all these different special uh, things in the tabernacle that they had that was only to be used for certain things. That's kind of the idea there. And he says, set them apart by your truth. Your word is truth. Now, it doesn't say your word contains truth. That would presuppose or assume that there's parts of it that isn't truth. All of it, 100% is truth. His word is truth. And devouring God's word is the key to our sanctification. There's all these other emphases we can put on related to things that, that we should be engaged in, but you cannot deny how much of a premium God puts on devouring his word. Again, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It's critically important for us to have a healthy, regular diet of God's word, not just on Sunday. If you only ate physical food on Sundays, you wouldn't be very healthy. You'd be a lot thinner in, in, in not a healthy way physically. So we can't think that we're going to grow and, 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 be, and be in the middle of what God's called us to if we're not being fed spiritually. We can't depend on anyone else to feed us. We have to be able to feed ourselves. Just like a newborn baby can't feed itself. But your hope is that eventually the baby will grow up and be able to feed himself. That's what God believes as well related to our spiritual growth, that we can be self-feeders, so to speak, and be able to commune with him through his word consistently. Pastor Chuck used to tell us in class, he used to say, sheep hunger for what you feed them. So if you feed them a bunch of junk, they're going to start craving that. They're not going to be healthy, but they'll start craving it. If you feed them good food, they'll crave that and they're going to grow. So that always stuck with me. Now he says in verse 18, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And I like how he's already talking about it as if it's already happened. You know, and he didn't notice, he doesn't say, I, I'm also sent them into the church. You know, I'm sending them into the church because that's all, we're, that's the only place where ministry is going to happen is in the church. So I'm sending these leaders into the church to, to make disciples and all ministry is going to happen in the church. He doesn't do that. I'm sending them out into the world. They're going to expand the gospel. They're going to expand the kingdom of God. They're going to bring the gospel to everywhere. And, and, and that's where ministry happens in terms of sharing our faith and, and helping people understand. There's a totally valid strategies related to inviting people. Of course, we should invite people, but we should also be able to be out there and be able to meet someone for coffee, explain the gospel, and if they're ready to pray with them to receive Christ um, right then and there. Every, God's working for that every believer will be able to um, lead someone to Christ wherever they're at. And, and he, he says, I've sent them into the world. You sent me in the world, but to that extent, I have sent, I'm sending them into the world. Verse 19, and for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified 
by the truth. So Jesus set himself apart so that they and us could be set apart by the truth. Amazing. He went to that cross for that purpose in part to, for that he, we would be able to uh, be set apart uh, for, him, for his sake and by his truth. Amazing that he would do that. There's nothing Jesus didn't do to enable us to be set apart to God. And he wants to transform us by the renewing of our mind. You know, we filled our minds with so much baloney. <laughs> well, not that's kind of a dated term, but with so much garbage. You know, you heard that term garbage in, garbage out. It's the same way spiritually. We filled ourselves, our, our minds with so much garbage before we came to know the Lord. And there's a process of time where God renews our minds by his word. You know, we're told in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. That word transformed is the word metamorphosis. We're transformed from the inside out by his word and by his spirit, he says in other places. From glory to glory, we're transformed. So he wants to take our corrupted minds, renew them, and, and he says that we have the mind of Christ in, in the New Testament. We have the mind of Christ. So he is, he is shaping our thoughts. He is renewing our mind all through his word, and he loves to do it. So just these, let me just summarize a few of the points that we looked at. Um, we were a gift to Jesus from the Father. We know Jesus was sent from God. We have kept or guarded his word. We have been sent out like they were. We have been prayed for by Jesus to be kept from the evil one. And he intercedes for us right now by, through the ministry of intercession. We are not of this world. We are being sanctified by his presently. Right now, we are being sanctified by his truth. So many great things. We haven't even got to where he's primarily focusing on future disciples, but we'll get into that next week. Let's pray together. Thank you, Jesus, for this great prayer that you let us in on. Thank you for how you're using it and how you have used it in the lives of your people. We pray, Lord, that we would have a passion to draw close to you and be fed by you, by your word. I pray that everyone in this room and everyone listening online would be transformed by your word, would fall in love with your word and have you transform and set them apart, set us apart through your word. Thank you that your word is truth. We thank you that you always tell the truth, Jesus. You always tell the truth. Lord, give us a supernatural hunger for your truth in an increasing way. And we thank you for using this passage in Jesus' name. Amen.